Hey guys, I'm Mark Duplass, and uh, these are the records I found at Amoeba. Or should I say, what's in my bag? Okay, my first choice, REM document. I was about 10 or 11 when this record came out. I heard my older brother playing Life's Rich Pageant, which was the release that came out before it, and it was exciting to me, but like maybe a little too dangerous or old or something, and Document kind of hit me at the perfect time. I think it was the first thing that I purchased and understood that you wouldn't just skip through to get to the songs you heard on the radio, that all the songs were, were worth something. I'd had the Cars Greatest Hits, and I was like, well, yeah, all the songs are great. And then I think I had had Madonna True Blue, and I was like, well, I'll just skip to the hits. The document broke it open for me. Like an album on its own, a full artist statement, could be great from front to end. And I thought in particular, you end side A with end of the world, you begin side B with the one I love. It was pretty mind-blowing for a prepubescent boy. It holds, the record holds up. It's great. This one goes out to the one I love. All right, number two. I don't know this record. It's like a weird thing that I just kind of missed. You know, you kind of have gaps as a fan. Like I, I, I didn't catch on to the Kinks for some reason, and just recently I like understood them. So I read her book that she wrote about her relationship with Robert Maplethorpe, and just got really into her as an artist and her process and her sweetness and her soulfulness. He wore the skulls. I wore a tie. We felt ready for the 70s. It's our decade, he said. And I was thinking, I, why have I not listened to her music? And so I've never heard this record before. Oh, baby. I think people like this one, right? Yeah. Yeah, like this is, a, this is a problem that I don't know this record. So we're gonna fix this now. This is kind of a double. These are two Joni Mitchell's 80s records. We have Wild Things Run Fast, and then we have Chalk Mark in a Rainstorm. A little more classic Joni looking. This, don't judge a book by its cover, or maybe judge a book by its cover. I've actually heard this record. My really close friend and collaborator, Julian Wass, who does all my scores for me. He knows me really well, he knows my tastes, and he sort of challenged me to challenge myself to appreciate 1980s Joni Mitchell, which is an oft maligned period in the Joni Mitchell canon. I mean, I think for people who love her, it's like Blue, Court and Spark, maybe people get into Hajira. Illumination, corruption, and diving, 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 diving. And then they perceive this sort of wasteland from the late 70s. And then there is a really nice record in 94 called Turbulent Indigo that unfortunately is not available on vinyl. The world is at your feet, but what about your heart? But most of the people are like, it's all garbage in there. But my thing is like, well, if you kind of lean into the bad synths and allow that to be what it is, the, the 80s-ish expression of it. I think there might be some gold in there. So this one I can confirm is good. Don't let the Chinese cafe be on our dives. Don't have this one yet, but I've heard it's also good. This is where Larry Klein, she was married to the producer Larry Klein, and uh, this is where they were making stuff. Larry went on to like really dig into like Sean Colvin and a lot of those like 90s songwriters. So I think the beginnings of it, this is 88, you can kind of start to see what springs out of that. So. We'll see. Why did you bring me to a place so wild and pretty? Riley Walker, Chicago, lesser known, 
When I first heard this, I thought you know, Jim O'Rourke, um, maybe the less experimental side of Jim O'Rourke, when Jim O'Rourke's got his acoustic guitar, so it's kind of like the jazzy acoustic thing. It's got a little bit of that Sam Precop, C and Cake vibe. It's just such a wonderful hybrid of cheap, light beer, slightly bloated Midwestern dude with extreme high intelligence, uh, amazing guitar acumen, and precision jazz. And those worlds don't often collide. It's kind of like Dumb and Dumber and John Coltrane. It's all here in Riley Walker's records. I was listening to this last year. I made a movie called Paddleton with my friend Ray Romano. Fastest land animal, 40 miles an hour. The cheetah goes 60 or 65. While we were shooting it, I was listening to these the whole time. So this is going to be one of those you have those records that are sort of seminal for a time and place. This is this is the Paddleton record, so excited about this. You hit the back road, you grab a car. My final record, Tangerine Dream. This is my favorite part about why records are important. I made a new friend today. It's this guy who's shooting from behind the camera. We were walking around, we were talking about records. I was talking about how much I love the Pearl and the sort of collaboration with Harold Budd and Eno. And he threw off into that Tangerine Dream as if someone who appreciated those things of course knows Tangerine Dream. And we both realized this is a huge gap. I don't know these things. And sure enough, this was one of the two records that he loved. Now I get to have this really great surprise. And this is what happens when you come to Amoeba and walk around and shop for records and you don't stay at home and listen on Spotify. So it may be a fucking disaster, but it might be great. Let's hope it's great. Yeah, Tangerine Dream. And that is what is in my bag. Cool, thank you so much. Yeah. That was really great. Sure. I, I actually have heard of this particular record, so I, it's not all on you. If, it, if I don't like <laughs> it, 